Honesty and transparency are how we operate. Supply chain challenges are not always easy, but the commitment from our team to take on the responsibility is unwavering. When you encounter a challenging supply chain crosswind, the whirlwind of options and variables rise and fall. You seek the shelter of predictability. You seek to find the eye of the hurricane. That's where we live. Dunavant, logistically speaking, we are at the center of it all. Track it, it's time for your nooner with Dooner. Welcome to Wednesday. Special Wednesday, by the way. I gotta give a little congratulations to my boys, everyone else's kids out there who has got a last day of school today. I know it is for us out this way. My boys are super excited in for uh, a long summer. Seems to end a lot earlier, too, than it did when, uh, when I was a kid. But a little cowbell for all of you out there. Before we get into some good news, some bad news, and what's going on in this world of freight. Because here's a, here's a quote to start the day. Maybe it's not the best foot to get started off on. But it's, uh, shoots not green. Take a look at this right here. It says, when we came into 2023, we were certainly optimistic about an improving half to 2023 environment. As the year's gone on, we've been concerned around what's happened over the rest of the year. I don't have any green shoots for you this morning. That is from Darren Field, president of Intermodal at J.B. Hunt. Um, he said that Tuesday at Wolf's Research Annual Transportation Conference. Intermodal is feeling the pain. Todd Maiden reports large declines in imports around 21% year over year in April at the nation's top 10 ports. Um, that's according to the Karen Report. They've highlighted shippers order restrictions and what they've had on freight flows. Maybe that will change. We're going to look in the crystal ball of sonar a little bit. Couple more headlines before we get into things today though, because this is kind of a follow-up on a story we talked about back in March. Freightworks, they had that mass firing. Take a look here, they let go a lot of their staff, including a buddy of mine I know, Jordan Kidd, he used to do their Life by the Mile podcast for them. Well, former employees are now suing the North Carolina-based trucking firm over these mass firings. Clarissa Haas has a story up on FreightWaves.com, but basically what happened is these employees are saying they failed to give them that 60-day notice before shutting down. In fact, the video that the company itself put out talked about how it all came together abruptly. When it, was, when it came out in March, they said, we, were un we are unable to see a path forward after a few of their core contract customers abruptly demanded significant rate reductions amounting to millions of dollars. The death knell occurred when one of FreightWorks' largest customers, they just pulled a significant percentage of their freight. And that was lights out. But of course, this impacted a number of employees that worked there, and now they want their own retribution. One slightly good positive story, though, before we jump into things. House Transportation Committee has okayed $755 million to expand truck parking. John Gallagher says the legislation to invest $755 million over three years to expand truck parking, it has advanced the House, and it passed it on Tuesday. It won assurances by letting Congress know where these funds would come from. The legislation, though, it now has to be approved by the full House with the uh, companion legislation in the Senate yet to be considered in committee. So still a long way to go, as it always is anything government. On the show today, I'm talking to Sonar Architect Daniel Pickett about how high-frequency data in FreightWave Sonar foresaw the freight recession. We're going to talk about the development of Sonar, how it all came together, how it works. We cite it so often. Why don't we talk about it a little bit? We've also got FreightWave's Alan Adler here. He's going to be talking about why uh, electric and autonomous vehicle stocks have been cratering, what it means for there, where are we going, what it means for the rest of the decade. Plus, he also got over to Peterbilt. He took a ride. He got a drive and the impressions from the uh, 589, their newly released truck. He'll tell us all about what he saw. So let's tip the band and we'll get into it. Supply chain challenges are not always easy, but the commitment from the team at Dunavant Logistics to take on that responsibility is unwavering. Dunavant, logistically speaking, they're at the center of it all. Visit them at dunavant.com. But right now, let's visit with our Midwest Bureau Chief, it's Mr. Alan Adler. Alan, looking good today. Thank you, brother. Good to see you. I like the, the jersey. Good the job. The pollen. The pollen has receded enough that I'm able to, I was finally able to take the glasses off. I, I, see, I see that. I still like the glasses, but okay. You're, I, it's you, man. What, Have you thought about you designing your own uh, your own truck tech shirt? I was shirt? complimenting you on the jersey. I like the jersey, the what the truck jersey. Well, I was going to say, if you thought of getting your own truck tech version, I know, and you could wear it to um, the Guardians that, game I'm, when we get to Cleveland. 
I'm looking behind you and I definitely want to get something for behind me on my show, right? Yeah. The, the, the truck tech show. I definitely want to do that. So I'll, I'll talk to, I'll talk to erstwhile executive producer Todd about how I do that. But yes. You are uh, speaking of good looking things behind you. You got to go out to this Peter built event. You saw their do 589 in action. Tell me a little bit about the Texas motor speedway and what went down over there. Well, they took over the whole place, um, which is interesting because the, the, you know, they probably didn't need it all, but they did do a special truck show, all Peterbilt's, uh, you know, 200 of them, basically some classics, some, uh, you know, just, just, you know, current trucks, all, almost all of those are probably in use, but, uh, so they had a little walk around for, you know, outside the track for, for the truck show. I think this is all stuff that Jim Allen shot out there, which is, which is awesome. Uh, he came up from Houston to do this and the new truck, uh, they, they made a big deal of it. They really did. And, and, you know, they, they brought out like 900 VIPs, you know, uh, dealers and, and, and then the, you know, customers. And of course uh, the plant in Denton isn't very far away. So, you know, a lot of those folks, uh, you know, 600 or so of those folks came out. So something over 3000 total people for this. Now, what's really interesting though, Duner, and you, you know, this, the, the 80, 589, which really dates back, you know, earlier versions date back to about 1954. Uh, this truck um, is not the main uh, uh, truck for Peterbilt, but it is the one that they're noticed by. I mean, look at the long hood, you know, look at the, the, you know, flat grill and all that. This is, this is the truck that people customize. This is the truck that, you know, has personality to it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a 579, but people don't get excited about, you know, customizing a 579. Here you've got your, you know, your 15 inch air cans, you've got your seven inch uh, exhaust, uh, you know, vertical exhaust. So, so all those things that make a truck a truck, right? I mean, this is, this is the real deal. This is the truck that truck people drive. Uh, it isn't one that, you know, necessarily that, I mean, some big fleets buy it, but mostly it's small fleets and owner operators who, who buy these and, you know, either customize them or don't. But they're, they're personalities, uh, you know, that, that, that have these trucks, right? What was, your, what was your impression seeing it in person? Did you get to go inside it? Did you get to go around the track? I did. I, I, I took a couple loops around the track, about a mile and a half track. I, I took a couple loops. Um, you know, my shifting isn't that great, but I got through it. And uh, I, I would tell you that for all the great looks, this truck rides so smooth. It's unbelievable. I mean, you know, you've got, uh, you know, you've got the, uh, uh, you know, you can still hear the motor, but they've done so much in terms of, you know, uh, sound deadening and things like that, that, that you can actually have a conversation in the truck. You know, I wouldn't put it up there with an electric truck in terms of quietness, but it certainly is very quiet and is super well mannered, uh, you know, uh, steering return, things like that. I mean, all of these things that the trucks are starting to get now to make them more comfortable to drive so that drivers aren't so, so stressed out and fatigued. Um, you know, they've, they've adopted here. Probably the biggest thing though is that this truck now is on the 2.1 meter, uh, cab size. So it's wider than the 389 that it replaces. And it does allow Peterbilt to make one single cab size for all of its full size trucks. Um, that's a big deal because you save a lot of money and a lot of effort if you're not building and buying parts for two different uh, platforms. So, you know, getting this on the 2.1 meter platform is, it was a very big deal on a practical level. What that does is it increases the room between the seats and it makes getting the sleeper cab. Um, if you, you know, if you're driving a, a sleeper, it makes getting back there much easier. You don't have to kind of twist and turn and contort to get back into the back. How did that windshield look in person? That was the number one thing that when I put a poll out there, drivers had remarked about some liked it, some didn't like it, some liked the old school styling, and then said that the, the windshield detracted from it. What does it look like in person? You know, I didn't really notice it, but then I'm not an expert. And I got to be careful here because where, where I think my expertise lies is more in the business side of things, less on the product. So it didn't stand out to me. I don't have a, you know, a real dog in that fight. And I think that, you know, the drivers are the ones who are going to notice that stuff. And, and, you know, I think Peter Bill's probably listening. I don't think anything's going to happen right away. They'll start building these, by the way, in the beginning of 2024, the first uh, 589 will be, you know, special, uh, we'll have special plates in them to show, you know, where they stand and, and, uh, you know, in terms of being unique, uh, you know, they're going to literally start at number one and go up to 589. So, you know, this is, again, this is not a truck that has been a huge seller for them. Uh, I would call it uh, the 389 came out in 07. They've sold about 110,000. So you can do the math and, and see that it's what, eight, 9,000 a year. So nothing like the 579, which is kind of the flagship for Peterbilt. What's the sticker on this? Do they, uh, they give any numbers out? 
No, they really don't. You know, I, the, the funny thing about trucks, you know, we used to come out of the car business, of course, at GM, and, and we always announced, you know, manufacturer suggests real retail price. Didn't really get into that. I mean, you hear it somewhat dooner on electric trucks because, you know, they're so much more expensive yeah. than diesels, right? I mean, so you say, well, it's three times the cost of a diesel and a diesel is 125000 or whatever. But since these are all specced individually, um, there really is no kind of base price. I mean, you know, you, you know you're going to have a, a list of specs, you know, your arm's length uh, to pick how you want the truck done. So California must be seething. Why, why are they selling diesel trucks? Why is Peterbilt making diesel trucks? Ban all the diesel, right? There's all this legislation coming in. But I just read an article of yours, too, and it talked about how desperate AV and EV stocks are getting, especially in this market where valuations have been drawn down. What's going on there? What is going on with this future of trucking and, and this very near, um, maybe fatal future for some of these companies in your article? Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a sorting out process right now, and and there are there is going to be carnage. There's no question about it. I mean, you know, just this week we were writing, and and we don't spend a lot of time on words on motors, except that it's a fascinating story. Um, you know, they were going to do a commercial, are doing a commercial uh, pickup truck. You know, kind of a class class three type of truck. Uh, you know, aimed at you know construction and things like that. But that that place has been a soap opera since it started, and you know, just this week, just uh, Monday, the uh, the board. Uh, authorized a, a, a what's called a reverse split because their shares are selling about 30 cents and the NASDAQ was going to kick them off the exchange basically and say, look, you've got to be at a buck for 30 days. Uh, you can't be under a dollar for 30 days straight. So one way to get around that is to do a reverse stock split. So they just did that. It just, I didn't look today, but the stock is probably about $4. So there's fewer shares. Didn't really do anything for them financially. It's more of a uh, cosmetic thing. But it, it sort of dodges that bullet of being delisted. We had a story on that yesterday. Um, but they have bigger problems, honestly. I'm just using one example here in Lordstown. Um, they sold the plant that they got essentially for free from General Motors for about $230 million to Foxconn. Now, Foxconn is the group out of Taiwan that makes Apple iPhones and wants to get, in the, uh, get into the uh, electric truck business. You know, they've got some business from Fisker for the next Fisker car coming out, electric car. Uh, they took over as the contract manufacturer for Lordstown, as well as buying the plant. But there was some of the money they didn't fork over because they were going to buy shares in Lordstown. And they said, wait, you guys are under a buck. That breaks the deal. We're not going to buy the $47 million. Well, Lordstown doesn't have a lot of money. It's got about $165 million on the books right now, that won't get you very far if you're trying to build trucks. So, or even design new products, you know, so we'll see what happens over there. Um, there's a chance that Foxconn will go through with it. I mean, you know, Lord sells one of those companies, a little bit like Nikola should have probably, you know, had a fork put in a long time ago, but didn't. And so they're still kind of limping along. Um, Nikola is another one. We talk about them all the time, Duner, but you know, they're compelling really. And uh, they're out today just saying, please, please, please vote for this, Proposal two, which will essentially allow us to double the number of authorized shares uh, in the company, and that will help us pay our debts because we owe a hedge fund a bunch of money and we don't have the cash for it. So, you know, there's there's that. Um, Hold on a second. Didn't they just, that. Alan, slow down a second. Didn't Nikola just make a, a like a pivot too? Didn't they announce that they're not doing BEVs right with with Iveco and they're moving on to the fuels? Like, what is going on there? Okay, so so Aveco, um, basically, uh, Garrett Marks, who's the CEO of Aveco, left the board, um, and now uh, they decided that they would sell their – that is, Nikola would sell its stake in the joint venture they have in Germany to, to build trucks – uh, they got $35 million, which is, you know, a, a few days of operating costs, I guess. And uh, But I think you have to watch Aveco because in the background, I could see a play where if this share authorization fails and Nikola is running out of money, I could see Aveco coming in. This is a super cheap way to get into this market. Um, you know, Aveco operates in Europe, uh, but it could get entry into this market by essentially, uh, you know, uh, buying buying Nikola. And, uh, you know, be a lot cheaper than what, you know, Volkswagen had to pay, say, for Navistar, about $3.7 billion a few years ago. They could get they could get in this market for next to nothing if they chose to do that. And and I think it's interesting, too, because Mark's leaving the board. You know, they've, they've sort of broken up all of the ties between the two, which could uh, presumably uh, cl make a clear path for Aveco to come in. What about in the autonomous space? What about Too Simple? They have been nothing but drama for what seems like the past few couple of years now 
What's what's going on there? They they're just hemorrhaging along the road. Well, you know what's interesting about them is their stock is up by a hundred percent in the last week. Now that's off a pretty low base, right? I mean, you know, eighty two cents or something like that. They're around two bucks a, a share now. Um, they also announced uh, that they're laying off another three hundred workers, and more more surprisingly to me anyway, is they said, you know what, we've been talking about selling off our China business. They certainly talked that way when they were, you know, being looked at by the federal government for, uh, you know, sharing technology with China and things like that. Uh, the government essentially cleared them, but but put, you know, some level of oversight in place. Now, uh, two civil servants saying, you know what, we like our China business, we're going to keep it. And uh, we think that it's going to do well for us. So uh, a real pivot there, um, you know, cutting another 300 work Workers. That was a surprise because back in, in December, the Wall Street Journal reported that TwoSimp was going to cut 50% of its workforce. Um, they ended up cutting 25%. But now if you take this cut, you're right there at 50 or 55%. So, you know, uh, it, it, was it done in two swaths? It's hard to say. But but the fact is that they are retrenching um, to stay alive. They're very concerned about cash, even though they have more money than most companies, at least as of the last time they reported. They're in trouble with the NASDAQ, not because of their share price, but because they haven't filed financial reports. And, you know, they have to do that. Uh, they just hired another auditor. The last one left because they thought, you know, um, there was too much uh, sort of a reputational risk around uh, working with Too Simple. So um, the drama continues. We'll see what happens, but nobody can really point to the reasons why the share price has essentially doubled in the last week. What about Embark too? They're they're another one. I remember I had their founder on like the day they rang the Nasdaq bell, and um, it didn't turn out too well for them because I think ever since that day it's been going down pretty far as well. They're not doing so hot, are they? No, they let go seventy percent, or in the process of letting go seventy percent of their workers. Um, they started that in March, and I'm not exactly sure where they stand. They've they've rather disappeared from the scene. At this point, so whatever comes of Embark or doesn't come of Embark will not look anything like what for a while seemed like a pretty uh, exciting place in terms of, you know, uh, really advancing. They were the first to drive across country uh, autonomously. Now, of course, with safety drivers, but, you know, running their system um Alex Rodriguez is a, a personal f a favorite of mine. I think he's a really smart guy. But, you know, even his co-founder, uh, Brandon Moak, left the company, you know, took a buyout. So so things have really kind of gone south on them. Uh, so they're out, out of the picture right now anyway. I don't know that they come back. I mean, maybe they've got some IP that could be sold or something like that. Maybe they become consultants to others. It's really hard to say. We'll just have to watch and see. So this whole space that you cover, it sounds like we're talking about a bunch of zombies here. Is is there one that you like? I mean, this all sounds like these are all companies that people are just watching them bleed out. There's vultures flying around. They want them to bleed out. They're going to take the tech. And that's the end of the story for, for some of these. What What is good? Well, you're going to have a couple that will emerge Um I'm not sure if I've got it right, but right now, you know, Torque Robotics, which, um, uh, you know, is, is essentially an independent subsidiary of Daimler Truck. Therefore, money is not an issue. They're not, they're not public. Uh, Daimler is, but they're not. And so their financials are not broken out. They're being very deliberate in the way they're doing things. They just announced a, a deal with uh, CR England to do some test runs and things like that. Uh, you know, they don't seem to be terribly concerned about, oh, we've got to have some, you know, commercial route figured out by the end of 2024. The two that are continuing to pursue that are Kodiak, are Kodiak Robotics, again, private companies, so we don't really know their finances, but uh, they operate, um, you know, we've had Don Burnett on this show. I'm sure you've had him. I've had him. Great guy, uh, smart, smart guy. Um, you know, they they seem to have a pretty good uh, business running there, but it's really hard to know the, the actual financials. The other one, of course, would be, um, would be Aurora. Um, they've also said they'll be doing a commercial route, uh, you know, no driver by the end of 2024. And they continue to make, you know, uh, some announcements that suggest they're getting closer. So those two right now, uh, Aurora and Kodiak and Torque 3, I guess, would seem to be the ones who are, are doing the best. Waymo has kind of, uh, you know, sort of taken a pause on what they're doing on the truck side. Um, they did just announce some stuff with with uh, Uber, which is interesting on the car side. But, but on the truck side, they seem to be, you know, pretty quiet right now. Um, and, of course, you mentioned Embark. 
you know, so, you know, it's, it's really hard to say, you know, leaderboard kind of question. Uh, but right now the ones that would appear. Just make a decision, would, Alan, you know, <laughs> make a call. We like, we got Kodiak. We'll give you Kodiak on that one. One little cowbell for that. Hey, we'll see you over in Cleveland, my man. The Guardians. Yes. Who are they playing? Are they, who are they? Who are they playing? Um, it's the Oakland A's. It's the Oakland A's who have basically shed everybody who's worth it, anything. They well, spread. The they have the no Dodgers fans at their stadium. They spread it out. They they've given everybody away again. Well, yeah, I know. I was seeing uh, footage from their stadium, and it was like on YouTube. All these people try to go there on like the least attended days possible at, at their stadium. Are they just going to give that to the port? It's, I don't know. Vegas doesn't want them stadium. anymore. They're moving. They're apparently moving to Vegas. They will no, be. No, the Vegas is like we're sick of it. We're sick of waiting for you. I, I thought of this the other night. They're the first team to have operated in four cities. Can you name the cities the A's have played in? No, I, I, I can't. I don't care enough. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you who they what are. What are they? Philadelphia, Kansas City, Oakland, and now Vegas. Four wow. cities. Well, they're, but they, the Vegas said the deal might be off, Alan. So we'll have well, to see. Well, who knows? We'll see. We'll have to see. Yeah, All but right. they got the worst stadium ever, just so you know. Well, I've been there, but I've only seen football games. They used to have it where there'd be a baseball diamond in the middle of a football field. Like, what was that? Yeah, as the stadium goes, I've been to 47 major league parks. It's among the worst. Well, you'll be to one more when we get to Cleveland. So see you in a month, Alan. Take it easy, buddy. Everybody go check out Truck Tech. Meanwhile, fighting fire with fire. Over here. Speaking of fighting fire with fire, you got hot markets, you got cool markets. One way to get on top of them is freight wave sonar. We talk about it all the time. We cite it all the time. How does it even work, though? Let me show you how the crystal glass is blown. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> what is up, yeah. man? I, nothing. I'm a long time listener. Uh, second time I've been on the show. The first time, uh, I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think I was not part of the show. No, yet. no. I, it's been a good four years. When did you guys get the <laughs> custom shirts here? So uh, custom shirts, the nerdery is, um, you know, it goes back to a, a, a Chris Farley, David Spade joke from, uh, from, uh, yes. yeah, from, from Tommy Boy. And, and so I think one day, yeah, one day, uh, I, I can't even remember, I think, uh, you know, Craig said, well, just get, y'all just go back there and take your calculators and go figure it out. And so we were like, okay, well, the nerds will retire to the nerdery and uh, with our calculators. And so that's kind of what we called our, our section of the office. And, and now we have, the, that's the Slack channel. So we had, we had nerdery shirts made. For those that don't know, yeah. they've, they've never met you before. They, they missed that, and I missed that episode. Sorry, that yeah, yeah. On the show. Who is Daniel Pickett? Yeah, What's so, a CTO uh, do at, at a company? Like exactly. Freight so I started at the company as the chief data scientist, and, and now I've taken over software development. Um, I, I lead the team of data nerds, of software nerds, of, of uh, you know, just kind of freight data mad scientists who are really, you know, we, we gather data from hundreds of different sources. We, you know, study what are the patterns we see in there, what are the actionable insights that we can actually help people make better decisions around their logistics and supply chain networks. So, um, you know, it, it, it's math nerds, it's programming nerds, it's software guys uh, who, who think about site reliability and security and, you know, customers trust us with a lot of data. So we've got, you know, we've got constantly uh, pressures to keep cybersecurity threats away. Uh, we, we, we're always trying to push the envelope on how do we make the data cleaner? How do we make it better? How do we tell people, hey, this is the right decision to make, uh, you know, and not have them come back a, a few days later and tell us, hey, you were full of it, man. So, um, sure. So, so yeah, we, we have a, a team of awesome freight data nerds. Uh, we've been at it almost six years now. And, uh, you know, but, but we, we, we were into a supply chain data way before it was cool. That's in the pre-COVID era. You had to make when, it. Yeah, when you told people what you did and they just fell asleep instantly. Um, but, you know, since, since COVID, everybody's got a story about, about supply chain now. So well, they know what it is. I mean, but sometimes it's like uh, it makes them a little bit too confident in maybe what they know. You for, know. for sure. But we'll educate some people. But before we do that, what, what is, before we go back in time and we talk about building Sonar up from the ground, what, what's like the 30-second elevator pitch on what you'd say Sonar is right now? Yeah, so I think Sonar is the, probably the, the, the fastest, most up-to-date source for what's happening in the physical economy. You know, the physical goods economy, moving things all over the world. Uh, you're not gonna find anywhere that you can, that you can get more current data on, on what's happening right this second, whether it be in China, whether it be in Vietnam, India, whether it be in you know, Kansas or California or you know, Florida, Miami, whatever, ports, air, rail, uh, trucking. Um, you know, we, we, have, we spend a lot of time and a lot of brain cells uh, chasing down you know, the freshest data we can find, getting it as clean as we can. And uh, so, so yeah, that, that's what Sonar is. It's, it's, some people call it the Bloomberg of, of the physical goods economy or, or of, of supply chain. Sure. Well, so 
but what was it? Like, I've been at this company for four yeah. years, and, I, and yeah. I heard there were big changes before I even got here, and there's been a ton of changes in the four-plus years that, that I've been here. Um, I think we even have a picture of a very early... Yeah, yeah, this is this is one of the like the early pitch back. decks. How did you meet Fuller first of all? So I I met Fuller. Um, I was I was at a, a uh, insurance company and I was doing kind of like quantitative uh, analysis on bonds and I covered rails. I covered uh, transportation companies. Um, and so you know we we met at the North American Commercial Vehicle Show in 2017. Um, you know, and I was just looking for what, what are interesting news outlets saying about commercial vehicle trends and electrification and uh, stumbled upon the Freight Waves blog and um, said, wow, they, these guys are in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and then heard that they were looking for a, a, a chief data scientist. Uh, and I said, I think I could do that. And that sounds pretty exciting to, to get in something new. Um, so, you know, I, I've spent most of my career before in um, financial services, so capital markets and, and trucking, you know, th there's a lot of parallels between what happens in trucking and what happens in, you know, the stock and bond markets. Um, you know, and I think you go back to the 80s, the way that we traded bonds in the 80s, massive information disadvantages. Brokers have these huge advantages, um, you know, wildly cyclical markets. You know, equities were that way in the 50s when there were hundreds of thousands of brokers, you know, and there were exchanges in every different city. That's, that's kind of how, uh, how trucking feels today and, and how maritime feels today. And so, um, so, you know, we said there's a massive opportunity to bring you know, transparency, really good fresh data, potentially some risk mitigation uh, tools to, to this industry. And so that's what got me excited and got me here. And that's what we're still trying to do. So you had to have some focus in the, in sure. the beginning. What was sure. the initial sort of data sets that you were pulling together? And what did the uh, 1.0 sonar sort of look like and feel yeah, like? Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they say it, it, if you're not embarrassed by your original product, uh, you know, then you, you weren't releasing early enough. You weren't pushing the envelope hard enough. And so, you know, early sonar was certainly inspired by some of those financial systems like a Bloomberg Um you know, I, I came from kind of a more a fixed income bond world. Craig used to be a, a, a day trader. Uh, but, but certainly, I mean, if you look at Sonar, you can see there's, there's some very uh, financial platform inspiration going on there. Sure. Um, you know, one, one aspect that's different is, is just that geography is such an important component. So Sonar 1.0 was you get a chart, you get a map, that's it. What are the early data sets? Uh, you know, one of our first hits is still our, our, our absolute banger. That's the tender reject index. Um, as, as well as, you know, tender volume stuff, and then, then figuring out the concept of head haul, you know, what, what has net inflows, what has net outflows. Um, you know, that, that was really important to us early. Um, but, but originally, you know, we were going to launch a futures market, and, and data and analytics was something yeah. we needed to support that. So, and, and so was news and commentary. And so, you know, the funny so story about Craig room, was, but I got to ask you, so yeah. you're, you're in a room just like, you're like a data nerd. And do you have Craig Fuller screaming at over your shoulder about the waterfall theory of freight? Oh, oh, 100%. And, like, what this actually 100%. Like, means? Because data, as, as you full know, right? Like data is just data. That doesn't mean anything unless yeah. it's context. context, right? And the biggest context, and I think the thing that it is always sort of espoused to us, those of you who don't get to go to our events, is Craig going on a, a spiel about the waterfall theory of freight. A hundred percent. And you can see that now in the, in the Freight Waves Academy stuff that we're putting out. Like you can, there, there's really good lessons on this. But yeah, I would say that, you know, the secret sauce, especially early was that you had, you know, math and data nerds. And they're sitting in the same room with these like freight experts. And so, you know, we worked with Craig early and Zach Strickland early and, you know, Learned a ton from David Bradford and, and um, you know, Mike Vincent, who used to be on the show, um, Dean Croak, who, who used to work with us. All these guys were telling us stories from their career and how things were working. And then, you know, we could go into the data and find those patterns and say, aha, you're telling me about driver resets and, and how the ELD is affecting them. We go look at ELD data. Sure enough, you see guys getting a traffic jam and go, I'm off duty. Maybe I'll be stuck here 30 minutes and I'll call this my reset. Um, you know, and, and you'd talk about, you know, hot freight, freight that uh, had, had fallen out of the waterfall on contract basis and has to be moved today or maybe even has a pickup date of yesterday flowing through the data. We know that's hot freight. That's a signal of shortening tender lead times. That's a signal that, that rates are going to go up. And, and sure enough, you know, the stories these, uh, you know, kind of experts told us about their experience in freight, we were able to look into data and find similar patterns. And that's kind of when we said, hey, there's something here to this company of, of getting freight experts and data nerds together and, and just having them explore. Um, that, that's, that's the early secret sauce happy accident. So the, one of the stories of Freightways, and if you ever heard, and we don't have to go into the full story of Freightways, but one thing Craig always talks about is sort of those 
those pillars. And initially, we had this idea of the freight futures market, right? Sure. And how do you inform a futures market? Well, you need a news aspect, and then you need some sort of tracking, right? You need right, some right. sort of yeah, information that gives people, you know, confidence about. What, what their view on the market is. Was or, that sonar always profile. at first? Was that was it always to tie into that sort of future thing? And when did that, that pivot happen? Yeah. We were like, wait a second. When did you have the realization that this this actually speaks to the entire market? It can talk to CPG and it can talk to truckload. And of course, it can talk to Ocean. You know, it, it's, it's tempting to say there was this great aha moment, but it was really a series of revelations along the way. Um, you know, like you said, futures was the genesis of, of the company. And you know it was well. You need news uh, commentary, and you and you need other data. So freight waves is largely the story of side projects going really, really well. Um, but uh, but but yeah. So I think we you know we had those conversations, and then we started to, as as we had our first events, we would show people sonar. We'd you know they, they'd come on our news, and they said, yeah, we're we're not really ever going to do the futures thing, but you know that could really help us with our capital planning, with our daily decision making, with how we order our day, and what loads we have to cover at 8 a.m. And what loads can wait until 2 p.m.? So, uh, you know, a series of revelations. And then, you know, you go and you meet some in air cargo and they go, wow, you're, uh, the spot load data in trucking is really highly correlated to air cargo. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. And then you meet some in maritime. And, hey, maritime rates seem to, maritime volumes and rates seem to lead trucking volumes by about the time it costs to, takes to cross the Pacific. You go, oh, my gosh, there's a correlation here. And so slowly, you know, it kind of became apparent that there was something even bigger than, than our initial goal here. Um, and, and that there really is a need for, for clarity and transparency around decision making. Um, you know, but using stale data to make decisions, it costs millions and billions of dollars. And you see these companies that go out of business versus the companies that maybe make smart decisions and maybe pare back some of their, you know, the, the, their asset, uh, asset count at, at, at the, you know, as rates start to decline. And well, it really does. I used to yeah. work as a marketing director for a freight company. Yeah. And we would look at things like the cash report. Yep. And one thing I would think is before I was doing the marketing, I was in the operations side. And one thing that would annoy me about these cast reports is it's like I'm writing about things that happened two, three, four, six months ago. Sure. Who is this advising? Like, is this just like cover your ass type data to say I made a right decision on the market? Because it doesn't advise. It doesn't inform me of anything. Yeah. It tells, tells me of what already happened, but if I'm paying my bills and I'm running the company, I already know that these things happen. Yeah, you know, I'm, you're glad you bring up the cash freight indices. You know, super important data set because it has so much history. Yes. And that history is valuable, um, you know, for, for, for one reason, especially as you're trying to train models and say, okay, I want to predict the next upturn and get ahead of it. I want to predict the next downturn and get ahead of that. And so um, that, that data is really good. Um, CAS does a great job, um, you know, kind of cleaning that data because they are a, they're a financial auditor. Sure. Um, you know, but, but like you said, there is a lag to paid, you know, paid settled data. They, they pay yeah. 30 days after the load is so delivered. I'm not delivered. saying that data is bad. I'm saying that data is good. However, there was, a, there was room in the market yeah. for data that is much more high frequency sure, and sure. much more instant. I mean, you know, I think about it as like a, 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 a battlefield commander getting reports versus a historian. Both are very valuable. Both are going to help you make better decisions. You know, one is going to inform, you know, kind of your long-term strategy. One's going to inform your daily operations. Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, we, we're, we are all about high-frequency data at Freight Waves and in Sonar. And, um, you know, really, you're, you're, you're going to get 30 reports before somebody who's putting out a, a monthly number is. Yes, high-frequency data, it, it, it may not be as clean and pristine as monthly data, but you're going to get 30 reports. We, we you're going to know which way the wind's blowing before that monthly data. We might be getting up. ahead of people. What is high frequency data and how does sonar work, especially yeah. specifically now? How does so like what are all you data nerderies doing in the background? Yeah, totally. Um, so high frequency data just tends to mean data that is reported very, very, very often. And, you know, a lot of the frustrations, if you get on financial Twitter, or, you know, or, or if you go to some of the, the conferences that are happening right now, you hear people that are frustrated with the Federal Reserve because they're making decisions with very old data. Yes. You know, inflation's still high, but if you look at what's happening in transportation, I mean, massive, massive, massive deflation. Uh, you know, housing, we just got a, a housing report that said housing prices declined 4.1% in April. But if you look at the data the Fed's using, you know, shelter went up 8%. And so high, high frequency tends to, you know, it's not extremely well defined, but we say, okay, very, very frequent reporting of data. Uh, and so in Sonar, you know, we're reporting, most of our data sets are updating every single day. And so, you know, while that can be a little bit noisy, um, you know, it, 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 you definitely are going to find out things sooner. And so, you know, that's why we'll look at things like what's the, what's the week over week change instead of quarter over quarter, year over year. Um, so, so there's ways to smooth out that noise, but the, the more information you get sooner, 
that helps you get ahead of you know whatever trends are changing. And and like you said, people that are using data that maybe is reported on a lag or it's quarterly data, but it comes out six weeks after the end of the quarter, you know, you, you could have had 90, 120 uh, days of data instead of waiting for that quarterly data point. And, and that's what I think some of the savviest folks in supply chain are, are starting to do. You know, people in, high, uh, in finance with high frequency trading, they figured this out in the 90s. Um, you know, and, and if you've ever read Flash Boys or any of those books, there's, well, there's wars about who can get the shortest wire from the <laughs> server to their, to, to their, uh, to their algorithmic trading machine. Um, I, I don't know that we're gonna get that extreme in transportation, sure. but, uh, but, but that, is, that is kind of the trend that is now playing out is if you find out things sooner, you know, that, that can improve your revenue, that can decrease your expense, that can improve your long range capital planning with regards to, are, are, we, are we turning up, are we turning down, are we, you know, are, we, are we kind of trading sideways? That data and that analysis led our own Henry Byers to sure. publish this now infamous article, US import demand is dropping off a cliff. This one- um, This is over a year ago. This was a June 7th- oh, I'm sorry, this was, I'm thinking June, of the it was, yes, almost, was a almost a year ago. June 7, 2022, Henry Byers wrote, container imports bound for the US have dropped over 36% since May 24th. Um, and that was his first indicator here. He outlined the whole thing throughout there, but you are right. If you look here, he, what he showed off was the inbound ocean TEU index right here. This is a chart from yeah. Sonar. You see that big drop. Now, it was just the start of the cliff. It wasn't a full-on cliff, but he was looking at that. He was looking at credit reports. He was looking at a bunch. And you can pair that with the article you're thinking of, Why right. I Believe a Freight Recession is Eminent by Craig Fuller, which was published all the way back on March 31st, 2022. And in that one, Craig Fuller pointed to the fact that March is typically a strong month for trucking as shippers start to stock their shelves in preparation yep, for this, summer. This, this he was summer seeing peak. this big change, that big boost in anomaly, and he looked at our outbound tender volume index, which is that next chart here, and that was dropping off. And those were the right. two signals that Henry and um, Craig took, and they were like, this is a massive totally. shifting market. I mean, a year ago, every light we had on the dashboard was on. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was when we said something's wrong here, guys. And you know, people looked at us like we like we'd grown a second head or something. It was very controversial. Uh, it, it, was, there was a lot was of people who reached out. There were people who screamed at us. They said, "You're manipulating data. You're changing the books. You're hurting our stock." And we're like, "We're not doing anything." Yeah, this you is guys what's are happening a, in the market. Look, when when rates are going down, we're accused of being a shill for uh, uh, on behalf of, of freight buyers. When rates are going up, we're accused of being a shill on behalf of uh, of carriers. And I, I mean, look. It, it, when the tide's coming in, you can stare at the dunes and pretend you don't see it. It's coming in. Sure. <laughs> um, you know, and, and when the tide's going out, it, it's going out. And, and so, you know, we, we don't uh, necessarily affect markets. And, and sometimes people say, well, you know, you cause this, this, company's, um, this, this company's stock to drop, and that's irresponsible. You know, what we're doing is reporting on market data conditions. And I think what's been borne out over the last year is, you know, we didn't, we didn't make something happen. You know, we, we told you it was going to happen before sure. it did. And, and, you know, eventually your earnings report is going to do to your stock what the news of, you know, declining imports out of China, declining uh, tender rejections, declining freight volumes, and, and even early declining rates is, it's going to hit these companies eventually. And so high frequency data is about finding out as soon as you can. Um, and, you know, investors have, have, have you know, for, for decades now said, I want to find out data as soon as I can. And now you have people actually operating businesses that say, you know what, if we find out sooner, we can make good decisions sooner, too. It's, it's not just about buying or, or, or selling, a, a, you know, a stock. It, it can be about refreshing your fleet, about, you know, going ahead and adding capacity versus maybe paring back capacity, um, you know, letting go of those unseated trucks or, you know, going ahead and taking uh, maritime capacity offline when, you know, early in the cycle, when you know this is coming, th there are decisions you can make that, that save money, that save jobs, that, you know, save, save efficiencies, you know, save carbon emissions. And so, the, you know, with high frequency data, you can make better decisions um, and, and the smartest companies are doing it. And, and we're seeing that in their results. What's a good use case that you have seen, especially since the freight cliff has happened? Since the freight cliff has happened, so we've we've talked to a number of uh, I've talked to about half a dozen carriers who you know within pro probably eight to twelve months ago said we're we're selling our trucks and we're becoming a brokerage. Yeah, and you know everybody said you're crazy. Rates are as good as they've ever been. Those guys uh, smell like roses right now. Um, you know, additionally, I, I think we we've heard about some uh, some companies you know just now starting to downsize fleets and, and maybe slow down on recruiting. Um, you know, there, there are companies that were taking those actions six and eight months ago, and, you know, while painful, you know, get, getting ahead of 
an asset that sits there and, and doesn't move, sure. you know, you've seen the used truck prices as well. Used truck prices nearly tripled from, from 2019 to 2022. Now those are coming right back down. Well, that's another point that we always make when people talk, oh, you're hurting our stock. You're doing this with the market yeah. calls. It's like, look, if this is falling off a cliff and you look at the elevated cost of equipment, there's a lot of people that look to our information or yeah. influenced by it if they're going to go out there and put these high notes. And as we just reported Last week, a ton of these notes are underwater now because oh, they, for sure. they, they bought it 120000 It's worth 80000 right now. But is there anything good going on in the market? So last time our, our big run-up was, was done by Ocean. Let's take a look at the Fredo's Baltics Index really quick, what it looks like today. Greg Miller, he said that um, shipping has been under pressure, right? We heard, what was for it, sure. Zim CFO? What did he say? <laughs> Zim CFO. This is almost like chef's kiss about this market. He said, it is precisely because some of our customers are pushing for rates below the minimum level that we are willing to go. That's why it's taking a little bit longer for us to make money. We do not intend to lock ourselves <laughs> into loss making cargo. They never do. Of course, they're right, right back where they started before this big pandemic. Although, although even with the GRI, things are moving up a little bit. So we, we've certainly, uh, through about mid-April, um, through maybe the first or second week of May, we, we sort of had a pause and a little bit of relief. Um, I'm sorry, the first week of May. In the second week of May, we saw rates decline again. For the last week, they've been picking back up. But, I mean, nowhere near as, as aggressively as, as many of these carriers like Zim need to see to operate profitably. Um, and, and, I mean, this is, this is all modes is, is what's happening. But rates have picked back up a little bit. I would love to give asset owners a, a rosy view, but I, I don't see a ton of green shoots on the horizon. You know, almost almost like that uh, J.B. Hunt quote from their call. We have, <laughs> that be, be, the show. behold our I field no of green, green shoots. shoots. It is barren. <laughs> no green shoots. Well, here's, here's slightly, slight, yeah. some slight pauses. And we started talking about this um, on the last show. In Blitz Week, it, it, yeah. we saw a little bit of, on, on the sure. inland, we saw and a little bit And you had capacity of taken out. So maybe that's a glimpse of what happens when a little more and capacity is taken out. So you get, Memorial you get a couple Day, so you weeks a, to stack, and maybe right. that makes pricing managers a little less less sensitive. But in the ocean, this is picking up too. Look, TEU yep. is coming to the yep. U.S. A little bit, of, and you know, it's not great, but it's the highest it's been in seven months. So this it, it, isn't sure. like a big headline Henry Byers story. It, it's a very muted summer peak is what it is. You know, it typically, is. We're, we're kind of changing out what's on the shelves because people buy different things in the summer than they do in the winter. So, you know, th this is usually a really big ramp up time. It's looking like a fairly muted uh, su summer ramp up uh, this year. You know, could, could, could we advance for another week or two potentially? But, you know, generally we, we are in the middle and even in the late innings of what is normally that summer peak for freight. And it's pretty soft. Yeah, the chart, because if you look at the next one here and you're, the blue line on this one is the truckload sure, rates. And you can see where it fell down and you got that nice bump to get sort of that little blitz week bump. But, but look, it just puts you right back where it you were you at the start right of May. That's all it really did. And, and no, nobody was feeling great about the beginning of May. No, um, it's not like, man, those, 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 uh, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. days of wine and roses back on May 1st, 2023. Yeah, the, the, the halcyon days are not back. And, <laughs> you know, when we look, what, what are, what are catalysts? What are events out there in the future? You've got student loan repayments starting. Yeah. That's not going to be good for the consumer. That, that's over a trillion. Um, you know, another thing is just like, uh, consumers took out loans at super low rates. Corporate entities took out loans at super low rates. There are trillions and trillions of corporate debt that has to be refinanced soon at higher rates. And so at just as, as uh, you know, people who are resuming a student loan payments are going to get squeezed, corporations are going to get squeezed by higher interest payments coming up soon. So there's not a huge catalyst out there. Um, you know, certainly we've got a, a, a deadlock over debt ceiling and what is government spending going to look like. You know, it looks like we're going to, you know, there, there's, I have to assume there's going to be some compromise there. Uh, but, you know, again, it's, a compromise means it's not going to be the, the wanton spending of, of the pandemic area and stimulus everywhere. So, you know, the, the, the three biggest events I can think of uh, on the horizon that, that would tell us is the consumer going to start buying more tend to say they're not. So you're not, you're not looking. When do you think recovery will happen? When do you think that the Craig Fullers of the world, the Henry Byers, or me and my newsletter on the show. When yeah. can I start talking about this recovery? You know, um, I, I mean, the, the great thing about freight and um, the great, uh, the double-edged sword, the great and terrible thing about freight is uh, so supply chain tends to see what's happening in the broad economy first. So, you know, I think we probably still have some pain for, for small um, or, or even, you know, poorly capitalized asset owners uh, across all modes. Um, and, and so as some of that capacity gets taken out, 
and demand, you know, you take out capacity and then demand only has to go up a little bit to really kind of breathe some life into the survivors. Uh, and, and so supply chain, uh, transportation companies will see the uptick first before the broader economy does. Uh, and, 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 you know, that w when we see supply chain kind of recover, excess capacity taken out and, and supply demand get to healthier levels, that's when I think we'll say, okay, maybe, uh, you know, may maybe a spring thaw is around the corner for, for the broader economy. But, but that, that could very well be into next year or, or at, you know, late in the fourth quarter. All right. Well, save your money, folks. <laughs> doesn't sound, I, I, I wish I had better news. I know, I you can't just make it up. I mean, it is, it is what it is. Yeah. Hold on, I have a couple things to look at with you here, but I gotta, I gotta tip the band. Send us the hard stuff. That's what Dunavant Logistics says. When you run into that really challenging logistical nightmare that keeps you up at night, call the good folks over at Dunavant. They make headaches disappear. Visit them at Dunavant.com. Daniel, Check by the way, out. your kids out of school today? Mine are. Yeah, yeah, school, school is over. Um, so gotta, gotta come into the office now because the home office is getting a little chaotic. Oh, it's gonna get, yeah. <laughs> it's going to get crowded in here. Well, it was Iron Man weekend, right? Was Speaking Iron of Man Donovan, weekend. they yeah. were in town for the Iron Man. Did you run it this year? I did not do Iron Man this year. I was at a, I was at a kid's soccer tournament. You were at, see, <laughs> and, get, and, when your kids get in the you got to be selfish, yeah, man. Exactly. You the, exactly. But I, I, I saw this bike online, and it says right here, uh, it's a bike with wheels shaped like a, what is that? I, I'm too dumb. Realu triangle? Yeah. yeah. Realu? Is this that is how a, you say that word? Yeah. Realu. Re, 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 Realu. Uh, it's triangle. the simplest and best known curve of constant width other than a circle. Would this make a good, like, what is the point of this bike? You know, uh, I, I guess could, uh, you know, could, could really shake things out a bit. Maybe, maybe take out some, uh, if you got some, some knots you need to work out. I don't think I'd want to take that thing 112 mile, 110 miles, whatever it is. No. Um, that, that seems like that'd be pretty terrible. It, it reminds me of the, the rotary engine in the old Mazdas. Interesting. So no yeah. Iron Man with that. What if it was like an I Iron Man slash it. like pickleball type contest? You know, I mean, maybe maybe they should. Yeah, they're throwing some pickleball. Uh, <laughs> you know, give people the option of this or like a penny farthing bicycle. You know, make a make a real uh, clown oh. event out of it. We, we'd probably have to cut the distance down a bit. Uh, Smart move. Well, speaking of our clown world, you're a chief technology officer, so I thought this would be a great topic to bring to you. Did you see this that happened the other day? The AI image of the Pentagon being bombed. These fake Twitter accounts said there was yeah. a bombing over at the Pentagon. Now, if you look at the picture, it was clearly not. It was clearly AI generated. It sure. wasn't even the Pentagon. Sure. Picture wasn't great. But somebody can put this out and move this, markets. And this is know, early yeah, innings. Yeah, yeah, make it make a couple million. Dollars. Now they say they also said it moved. It dumped the market. Dumped five hundred billion. I don't. I mean, the market was doing bad. Yeah. Anyway. So so I, I'm I'm too young to actually have like experienced firsthand War of the Worlds. But have you yes. ever read about the whole World War of the Worlds like radio show? And yes. Some people did not realize this was fiction. Um, and, and I think maybe, maybe we're kind of seeing a, a new iteration of this. You know, it's kind of believe none of what you hear and half of what you see. Uh, we, we may have to haircut that down to, you know, like a tenth of what you see here, here soon. Or, 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 or uh, you know, see with your own eyes rather than, rather than a photo of. But, uh, but yeah, a, a generative AI is real. It, it, it is impressive. It, um, you know, it, it certainly has some limitations. But, but, but yeah, it, it can fool a lot of the people a lot of the time. Do you think we have a, a major incident where a war is started based over an AI false alarm? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, could, could there be skirmishes and conflict? I mean, clearly there has been social unrest and, and interpersonal conflict in this country. We fight based over the on simplest misunderstandings right, 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 yeah, or just right. the simplest yeah, ideological exactly. misunderstanding. Exactly. Well, I watched a YouTube video. Well, I read a paper. You're wrong. You're right. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, you know, and, and so, yeah, it's entirely possible. You know, I like to think that, you know, in, in most sophisticated government military operations, that there is going to be a certain level of vetting. There's going to be, um, you know, much like uh, our sonar users, we would encourage them to do, let's yeah. look at multiple data points before we make a decision. Um, so, so, you know, I think, I think certainly I'm, I'm pretty confident having known several of the men and women uh, who served our country that, that we, we consider multiple data points. Um, you know, that we're responsible here, but, you know, certainly as we've seen, th th there, are, there are governments out there where maybe they're not considering multiple data points and, and they're sure. autocratic and, and very, very top-down driven. Um, you know, so, so it, I, I would not rule it out. Well, because it's not AI that did this, it's a person that decided to, sure. like, punk everybody. And, sure. Uh, although punking someone on something that could turn into, like, World Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's, a, it's a lot cheaper than blowing up your own drone over the Kremlin to sure. just, you know, to just make a little AI See photo. See if it works. Yeah, yeah. I, what I, about I, AI and sonar? Are you ever, uh, any incorporation? So, there? so yeah, there's, there's absolutely, um, you know, we, we've been using machine learning to do forecasting for some time. Um, we've used un, unsupervised learning to kind of figure out what are the, what are the right shapes and zones to, to do things. Um, 
we, we, as we're as we're trying to figure out how do we you know kind of report some of the same data on Mexico. Yeah. Um, that there's not as established a, of a series of zones and, and market areas there. So using some of that there. Um, you know, all over freight waves, it's being used. It's being used a lot on the media side to generate content. It's it's being used in in kind of predictions and, and drawing maps. Um, so, so yeah, certainly. I, 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 the truck writes its own stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, you cannot be imitated. The AI is not that good yet. But um, but but certainly, I think you know, it, it is a tool. It is not necessarily at the stage yet where it is a replacement yes. for for a lot of things. And you know, and one challenge with AI is. Why did you do what you did? I have it has no idea. It in many cases, take responsibility. It, it, exactly. Yeah, it is, it is a black box, and, and and you know, I mean, generative AI, it's really good at plagiarism. Yeah, but it's plagiarism. It, it's it's not doing original thought yet. It's doing really really great plagiarism. All right, UPS strike is looming. UPS has 350,000 unionized workers. They deliver 24 million packages a day. UPS says it's six percent of the GDP. August first. They say they're going to hold a hard line. They're going yeah. to strike if they don't get a deal. Does it happen? That, that, that's a challenge. You know, if, if ever there was a time um, for for management to play hardball, it would be during a fairly weak period when maybe your profit is only marginal. Um, however, there, there's still. I mean, we, we, we've had a we've had a decline in total volume of packages and total revenues, but I can't imagine that uh, that that these guys don't strike a deal. Um, you know, it's, it, there, there's still a lot of parcels moving. There's still a lot of, uh, of, of consumer staples that have to move, you know, that, that are not flexible to price. Well, the workers, and, though, they're not, they, don't, they don't care about the, the sonar chart. They said annual sure. profits at UPS in the past years are close to three times what they were before the pandemic and since the last time they signed an agreement in 2018. This is a union, so that, they already have a pretty strong case. Sure, sure. Revenues are up. We didn't, that, that's we a challenge, you know, yeah. but, but I mean, I think some of this goes back to your, your comment about stale data. Earnings... Or what happened in, you know, I, as somebody that loves daily data, yeah. four months ago is the distant past to me. So, um, you know, I think they, they, they certainly have a point that uh, a, a lot of the inflation we've experienced is cost of cost of goods going up. Sure. But a lot of it is corporate profit taking as well. And, and so yes. that, you know, from that standpoint, that is a fair gripe that, that a significant portion of our inflation has been increasing profits, not just increasing costs. So uh, from that standpoint, they have a fair argument. Um, certainly, the, you know, the cost of living for these drivers has gone up. We've experienced it here at Freight Waves that, oh, sure. you know, cost of living for all our employees have gone up. And, and certainly there's, there've been competitive pressures uh, in, in the labor market, um, you know, maybe easing a little bit, but, but still the labor market is very, very tight. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think that management will have to negotiate here. Uh, they, they, they need to find a compromise because, no, no, you know, the drivers don't want to go without paycheck and the management doesn't want to go without, without revenue coming in the door. So I can't imagine they, they don't find a compromise here. And, and as you pointed out, there's an awful large profit margin, um, you, you know, uh, still there to protect the company from going negative. Well, and on the consumer and economic side, I, I don't know if anyone's there that can step in to pick up 24 million packages a day. I don't think we just have that excess. I, I don't think we Even in this market, I don't think there. we got that excess um, capacity. You know, uh, look, USPS and, and DHL and FedEx, I'm sure, um, you know, would love for that to happen. But, but I, I can't, I, I don't think that combined they could all handle it in a reasonable amount of time. You're right about that. You ever pay the lumper fees over here? Look at this. Some Redditor is screaming mad. They say that they had it for two-hour unload. They were charged $1,200. He said it's the biggest ripoff that he has seen to date. You know, uh, lumper as a um, it, it's, it's a necessary thing. I, I, that still strikes me as one of the, like, uh, you know, uh, organized, uh, organized crime, organized uh, crime, <laughs> chaos, two things. Like, why is there always so much this contention is, over it? This is a relic of of uh, of, of the earlier days of, of how transportation worked. Um, you know, they provide a good service, but that that is a that is an area that is ripe for disruption. Um, if anybody is watching the freight tech scene and and you know looking for a a, a nice juicy place to sink their teeth, uh, Lumpers is a great opportunity. Now, if you were driving behind this car on the road, we're going to rate some strap work here. Look at this one that the police officer okay, pulled over. Get the sound up on this one, too, because the cop is going to be kind enough. To stop this truck. Get the sound Drive up behind on it. it the and noticed a load of rebar steel. Little the middle bundles action. here. Yeah, I'm seeing final destination. At all. I mean, this goes right to the front of the truck. That's, and you can see 
These bundles are wrapped. Obviously, but yeah, there's no this, downward this pressure seems, being applied uh, by any of these straps. Like how you get a, uh, a or anywhere down the middle of the truck. Uh, yeah, it's not a magnetic. The bundles aren't you, touching, which means that as the truck drives down the road, there. these bundles could move forward or move inwards, which would yeah. loosen off these straps as well. And if you've seen the movie Final Destination, <laughs> like, hey, mention, he mentioned Final Destination. You know why you, the problem. Do you move when you're behind these vehicles? Oh, every time yeah. I see one of these, I uh, listen. I, I drive with a lead foot, uh, but but no, when I see when I see that kind of danger ahead of me, I, I back it right on off. I, I there can, was um. There was that uh, just just down the street over here. The the bar went up from the back of someone's truck, killed someone just last week. Yes, I, I heard about that. It's always yeah. so frightening. Every time, yeah. like right through the windshield. I, I mean, look, th there's a reason they say don't follow too closely on on these oh, things, yeah. especially. Uh, you know, especially a flatbed, but uh, you, you never know what is inside a dry van. And you know, as, as my oldest kid starts to approach, uh, starts to approach driving age, and and even like when, it, when we're on the highway, I tell my wife, like, hey, you don't know what is in the back of that. Yeah, <laughs> it could tip this way and come right through there. You know, make a safe, clean pass. Don't linger beside him in the blind spot. Right the time, man. You gotta all play, right, play right. yourself off. Hey, Daniel, right. hey, pick it you here. Go check me. out Sonar. Thanks for giving us some history all lesson. Right. We'll see you guys soon. Daniel Have a great afternoon. Enjoy your Wednesday. Congratulations on that. Congratulations to your kids. Yeah. Take yeah. care. All you out here, congratulations to your kids. Thanks for joining the show. We'll be at Friday at noon Eastern Time. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Duna. That's D-O-O-N-E-R. Take care. And don't be a stranger. <laughs>